we have a quorum and so I declare the meeting um, open. I believe, do, um, Ms. Knighton, do we need to have that, that motion that we always say? Yes, you need to suspend the rules to participate electronically. Would someone like to do that? Uh, I move that we suspend the rules to allow us to conduct this meeting uh, electronically using utilizing the Zoom software uh, in accordance with the governor's prior directives relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. Do we hear a second? Second. second. Uh, Ms. Knight, would you call the roll? Yes. Uh, Alderman Fisk? Right, not present. Wynn? Alderman Wynn? Yes. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferden? Was okay, Alderman Morvell? Aye. And Alderman Rainey? Aye. Okay, uh, I Ms. Biden, thank you. Do we have do we have to call the roll for the committee meeting? You have to call the roll for everything except the adjournment. Okay. So would you call the roll for the committee meeting? Oh no, we do not have to. I don't think we have to do it for that to call the order. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry. Yeah, it's as if I've never been in one of these before. <laughs> so, uh, uh, our, I, so we have several items uh, for the agenda tonight. The first one is P1 renewal of contract for landlord tenant services with the Met Metropolitan Tenants Organization and Lawyers Committee for Better Housing for October 1, 2020 to December 31, 2021. Second. Everyone, before we do that, can we do minutes? Approval oh, of meeting minutes? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm I'm operating from my paper calendar, uh, paper copy, and it doesn't have that in it, but that's okay. Um, uh, do I have a motion regarding the minutes of the uh, the last meeting, which I, the date I don't move approval, move approval. Perfect. Meeting. Perfect. Uh, Ms. Nine, would you call the roll? Sure. Uh, Alderman Fisk. Alderman Wynn? Yes. Alderman Wilson? Yes. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferden? Alderman Ravel. Excuse me, Alderman Ravel? Aye. And Alderman Rainey? Aye. Okay. Motion passes. So the minutes are approved. Thank you all. So now we'll move on to item P1. This is the renewal of the contract for landlord tenant services with Metropolitan Tenants Organization. Uh, from October 1, 2020 to December 31, 2021. Uh, the length of that time, the, the extra length of that time is to uh, make it align with the city's uh, fiscal year. And my understanding is that, uh, Sarah, you have a presentation for us. Sarah Flax. I do. Um, let me um, share my screen. Thank you. Let's see if I can pull this off. Um, <laughs> no, I gotta get to the right part of my screen, sorry. Let's see, start my video, that's good. Now, hang on. All right. Now I've got to see if I can get this in the mode so you can actually see it. Um, so um, this is just a brief summary of um, our um, current year contract uh, and as background and results of what kind of calls and cases we've been seeing. Um, really quickly, our uh, landlord tenant program is provided by Metropolitan Tenants Organization and Lawyers Committee for Better Housing. Um, services include guidance to landlords and tenants provided via the hotline, trainings, doing draft letters and negotiation assistance on the various things that come up in landlord and tenant relationships. Um, uh, we also get, we as staff get updates on national and state policy and legislative changes that um, could affect what we are doing. Uh, it's been specifically very helpful when we're dealing with all of the moratoria that are going on for evictions right now. And um, their uh, mediation, tenant organizing, and legal representation of low-income tenants is also part of the contract. Um, 
really quickly 2020 cases um, information. Um, and this is actually the um, 11 months of the current contract. Um, to date, um, there have been 409 separate cases. Um, you can see the quarterly totals there. Um, so we have um, an increase in um, uh, total cases. Um, so we're, our monthly average is almost 37 cases per month, um, rather than the um, 30 we were estimating. Um, so that's a 34% increase over prior year. Um, we're seeing some differences in the types of cases um, that we're seeing as well. So what uh, this chart um, I'm showing you because I want to show you how we track and how we're going to report on a quarterly basis to the Housing and Homelessness Commission who have already seen this information. So they'll be regularly seeing um, the results and then we will bring additional information to council just as a report so that you are also aware of what's going on. Um, so the, two, the 409 total cases um, so far in this contract year, as I say, averaging 37 cases per month, that is a 34% increases versus the same period in, in our prior contract year. Um, in addition, um, we did three trainings. Uh, they were all via Zoom and they were all focused on, on changes due to COVID-19. Two of them were focused on tenants. One was in English and one was in Spanish. And we had great help from our staff, um, including, including Paulina Martinez on that. She was one of our hosts. Um, we also hosted one for landlords and property managers. And those recordings are on the city website. So one of the things that we found out is we actually got a lot more viewers than we do when we have in-person um, um, <laughs> sessions. And this may be the best way to get information out in this case. Um, percentage of cases by type. Um, you know, some of the things that continue to be the highest ones are um, maintenance uh, and lease questions. So it's a little bit hard to read this, but you can see the range of um, different types of cases. Um, another piece of information, most cases are initiated by tenants. Landlords Cases that are initiated by landlords make up about 7% of the total, although I think that we may be seeing a little bit of an increase. Uh, and the questions that are more common from landlords relate to um, security deposit interest. That's always, everybody's always trying to figure out how the security deposit interest can actually be as low as it is because it's almost non existent. You know, notices to tenants, um, things like that, but more recently also more questions about eviction moratoria and, and what what they can do um, under COVID-19, you know, entry to tenants, units, that sort of stuff. So we are seeing some changes. Um, significant changes um, this year over last in questions about eviction cases. Now, that is, of course, largely due to the um, COVID-19 and people not being able to um, pay rent. Um, disturbances, we've also seen an increase in calls about disturbances and utility payments and early termination. Um, what are consistent still are the top two categories overall continue to be maintenance and um, lease questions, which compromise, which comprise 42% percent of cases. And there is some seasonality in um, the types of cases and we haven't seen huge changes in that. Um, what we are proposing this year is a 15 month contract that will run from October of this year through December 31st of next year um, in the not to exceed amount of $87,500. This is actually the same amount on a per quarter basis of $17,500, but covers five quarters, even though we don't necessarily bill it on that exact 17,500. Base scope of work, which is the um, uh, ongoing support uh, uh, services for landlords and tenants through all the different media we talked about and the trainings um, is would be divided 
out over the five quarters and build um, one fifth each of those five quarters. Um, what we are proposing is increasing the amount of money that is being paid for the base scope of work from what was paid for in this contract year um, and reducing the amount that's available for additional services, um, which are mediation, tenant organizing, and legal representation in court. Um, partly, well, first and foremost, we've seen a pretty substantial increase in cases um, the, um, from 30 on average a month to 37, but also um, because um, that is just you know the ongoing need we expect is going to be continue to increase um, in the near term because of all of the challenges and changes um, due to COVID-19. Um, we do expect we did not use much of the um, um, sort of as needed services, the, the services that are billed as they are incurred, the mediation, tenant organizing and legal representation in court. And part of that is, you know, we the courts were shut down um, starting in March. So some of the things that would likely have proceeded to court have not yet done so. But we do expect that mediation and legal representation in court will certainly, those needs are going to be picked up and those dollars will be expended in the next contract period or the, um, once all of the moratoria burn off. And that um, will be a big change from um, last year. So. Those are the, that's my presentation. Um, and if there are any questions, um, I also have, um, I believe both Mark Schwartz and um, John Bartlett are um, available to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I'm now trying to unshare my screen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, and Johanna, we we don't have anyone who signed up to speak for this, correct? No one has signed up to speak for this item. Okay, and it's been have we? It has been moved and seconded, um, uh, I believe. So, can you take the take the vote on this? Take the roll. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Bruce Simmons. Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. And Alderman Rainey? Aye. Okay. Yeah, I have it. The motion passes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, again. Uh, and thank you to the MTO for all of that good work. I've re referred to a number of my residents to them. Uh, so now we're going to move on to item P2. This is resolution 73R20 approving a plan of subdivision for 2404 Ridge Avenue. Do we have a motion so that we can start discussion? Second. I'll move approval. All right, thank you. Uh, I understand Ms. Knighton, we have several speakers who'd like to speak on this. Sure, yes, we do. Uh, Chris Abermade, uh, Pete, Peter Miller and Sean Jones in that order. All right, well, let's start with uh, Chris Abernathy. Well, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, I, uh, last year in December, we first learned that the, um, uh, the developer was asking to subdivide the land. Uh, we put together a presentation that outlined some, some civil engineering concerns that the neighborhood had about uh, subdividing the land and building on that property. Um, that had to do with water management and uh, extreme increases in the amount of traffic on a narrow unpaved alley. Um, that is the only um, means of ingress or egress to the property. Um, we never heard back from the city staff about our specific concerns. Um, and we'd, we'd like that to be addressed before any decisions made uh, about the subdivision of this property. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who do we have next? Is it Sean Jones? Uh, no, it is Peter Miller. Then I'm John. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miller, are you with us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to second uh, my colleague, Mr. Van Arbutman's uh, comments and note that if the resolution as framed is approved, it will cause significant irreversible negative effects on 
the Colfax Street Ridge Avenue neighborhood. And the resolution, any resolution subdividing the property needs to deal with the traffic and the flooding issues that threaten the neighborhood if the, uh, if the subdivision is approved. The current resolution simply ignores these issues. Finally, any resolution to incorporate the exist, any resolution that you would consider should incorporate the existing covenant of agreement in perpetuity between the, the city and the owner of 2404 Ridge Avenue. This covenant covers the entire property, including the, sub, the, the portion that's supposed to be subdivided. This covenant could be expanded to regulate the amount of parking permitted on the property and also require measures that will prevent any additional flooding damage from construction on the subdivided plot. In summary, the current resolution is seriously deficient, and I'd urge you please to reject it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Jones. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I represent the property owner of this property. And first, I want to discuss this property. This is a large subdivision. This is not one of these tiny Evanston lots. Uh, 35 foot wide is required and this lot would be 45 feet wide. It is 200 feet deep. Uh, zoning administration has passed this easily. It, it complies. There's no issue with making this a single family lot. What we do have some issues with are the conditions that city staff added to this proposed subdivision. Most importantly, the uh, condition A, which requires a dedication of a certain piece of property. In other words, the city, in order to subdivide this property, is requiring my client to give the city uh, a piece of the alley. What I was proposing, and I was hopeful that you would consider, is that we either remove these conditions and allow this to go forward, or we pull it and we discuss, because this piece of the alley has been used by the city for quite some time. Apparently the alley is rather narrow and garbage trucks cannot turn without using a portion of my client's property to turn onto this alley. We have been in discussions with the city, not me personally, I'm coming into this rather late, but there have been discussions with the city as to how to get this piece of property into city hands. I have heard that there has been an appraisal to give us a value for this slice of the alley. My client is willing to accept the appraised value of this slice. Uh, I do not believe it's appropriate for the city or legal for the city to require him to give a piece of his property in order to subdivide. That is appropriate if it is absolutely necessary for the city to deliver services, but that's clearly not the case here because the city has been using this piece of the alley for a while. It's not appropriate and caused by this subdivision. And there's case law on that point, which I've shared with at least Alderman Wilson. The second condition, condition B. Mr. Jones, is, could, you, could you wrap it up quickly? Uh, sure, but I, I represent the property owner here. Condition well, I'll, B I'll is you, a- I'll give you another minute. Okay. Condition B is a view easement and there's no parameters on this view easement. I'm not really sure what that would mean. Seems that that only comes into play after there are plans and we know what kind of structure is going to be there. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any bearing on the subdivision. We do not have any trouble at all with uh, locating the sewer as part of the subdivision. That's condition C, no issue with that. And the, the confirming that well has been capped. We don't have any problem confirming a wells cap. So condition D is not going to be a problem either. Um, but I do think it makes sense for us to meet with the city to try and see what we can do about this piece of the alley. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee discussion. Yes, Alderman Ravel. Um, we'll to go first to the suggestion that we um, have some uh, discussion. I mean, we've been having discussions for easily a couple of years, I think, um, over uh, the alley and other issues with this property. So I'm, I'm not sure that 
additional discussions are going to be productive. But uh, what I'd really like to address first is um, my serious concerns about uh, granting this subdivision. Um, the, as you've heard already from a couple of the neighbors, uh, the access to this property um, is through a very narrow unpaved alley. Um, it's used heavily by pedestrians, many of them children on their way to Leahy Park and the golf course. Um, it's currently the, it's the access for the residents for the main house, um, the 2404 Ridge main house. Um, and since there's no on-street parking on Ridge, um, it's also the access for any visitors to the house. Um, the property owner is in the process of renovating the barn uh, with the hopes of making that into an auxiliary dwelling unit, which he would then like to be renting as well. And the residents for the ADU and their guests would also use this alley. And then if there were a new house built on a new lot two, those residents and their guests would also have to use the alley to say nothing of all of the construction vehicles that would, um, it would be pretty horrendous um, for the neighbors to have to live through the traffic, the construction traffic for any kind of house that would be built on lot two. Um, and then um, going to the whole concern about the view easement, that's one of the condition, the condition that the Preservation Commission suggested. Um, so in, in the statement of significance um, for um, making the this property the um, a landmark, it talks about how it the main house gains additional importance from its conspicuous site atop a rise in the land, a common location for early early settlers' houses when these were available. And so a, a new house on lot two, even with the generous front yard setback that this condition, view easement condition would require, um, would really intrude on the pastoral setting of the uh, of this landmark house and its barn. And um, the, the view easement is really essential. The, the, if you walk along Ridge Avenue coming to the house from the south, um, you get a wonderful view of the farmhouse across lot across what would be lot two. So any any house that would be built there would have to be set way back in order to preserve um, that view easement of the main house. Um, so I'm uh, I'm urging the committee to um, vote no on this proposed subdivision. Okay, thank you. Any other members of the committee? Alderman Wilson. Um. Okay, so here's here's I'm struggling with a few things here. Uh, the first thing is that we're being asked to vote on a resolution to do this subdivision, but it's not actually the subdivision that the applicant is asking for. See what I'm saying? So, you know, we've, it, he's asking for X without these conditions and we're voting on Y, which is something different than what he's asking for. Mm -hmm. So, um, like that doesn't make a, enough sense to me. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, you know, whether we voted up or down, um, you know, it's not even what he asked for. So maybe what he's asking for is even less appealing than what this is. So I'm just kind of struggling on why we're voting on, you know, this particular resolution. Um, you know, when I first, you know, first got wind of it and first, you know, glanced at it before, my assumption was that this was something that had been worked out and, um, and there was an understanding on that. And I understand that there's been very, very extensive uh, conversations um, a lot of iterations of, of what this could or might or might not be. And, um, but it's, it's clear that there's not what I'll call a meeting of the minds on, you know, what the applicant's looking for, uh, and then what the staff is suggesting. And then there's, doesn't even seem to be, uh, necessarily a meeting of the minds on, um, as proposed. Um, so I'm having a hard time voting on it at all. <laughs> am I, am I, is my, is my concern making sense? Yes, somewhat. So, you know, it's, it's from the applicant's perspective, um, this isn't what the applicant applied for. So, um, so do you want to move to hold it or table it or? I mean, I, I, so that's the problem. I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, 
you know, uh, the, uh, the, I, the, I think the applicant's counsel is here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if the applicant is here as well. Um, but maybe if Mr. Jones could just, you know, confirm, you know, one way or the other, if my understanding is correct, that this is not, uh, this resolution isn't what the, um, and I think your public comment made it clear, this resolution isn't what the applicant's asking for, correct? Yeah, this was not what was applied for. These conditions were not part of the application. I would uh, suggest that this should be held to give us time to discuss with the city the best way to approach it to deal with these conditions, because once we deal with the conditions, we'll be ready to go. Thank you. And, and, that, and that makes some sense because, again, we're, we're voting on something that's not what they asked for. So if we turn it down, um, we haven't even rejected their application. We've rejected, in effect, a counterproposal. So, right. uh, I, I, Alderman Wilson, uh, I have uh, Alderman Rue Simmons' hand, and also um, the staff has indicated that this has been held once. So I believe then we couldn't hold it a second time, but we could table it to a date certain. Okay. So yeah, I'm just going to add to Autumn, to Ottoman Wilson's point, more clarification on what we're voting on, what's the goal, um, what's the expectation of the resident, and if we could table it to a date certain to get those answers, maybe the resident's council needs to speak to our law department, or maybe Ottoman Ravel, but it's not clear on what the ask is. Yeah, and I think I'll just interject because I, I do have the understanding in listening to Mr. Jones, it sounds like they have been involved in the law department, but I, I just think what we need on our plate as far as, you know, us taking an up or down vote um, is what the actual application is. So, you know, so if we reject it and they appeal it to court, you know, how do they appeal a rejection of something that they didn't ask for? You know, in, in other words, their application wasn't denied or accepted. Uh, yes. Okay. I see that point. And um, I would agree with that. I think that we, I mean, certainly we could hear that what the staff recommended to them. Um, but if they were unwilling to accept that, then we would vote up or down on what they, what they had originally asked for or what they wanted, wanted in the end. So, uh, and then, then it would be clear that either uh, that we didn't agree with their goal or, um, or we did. So uh, with that, would someone like to make a motion to table this to a date certain? Um, uh, we could do. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just looking. Oh, at no, my next meeting would probably be too soon, given that packet yes. is due relatively, basically in a week. So are we looking at um, October 26, Mr. Jones? Is that doable? And the staff is that doable? I, I would. I would uh, ask the law department to weigh in as well on that date. That date would be fine with me. Um, my client, I don't know, but I'm certain that I could meet with my client and represent my clients uh, when we were having when we would have a meeting. Okay. Uh, date's fine. All right. Uh, law department, Mr. Cushing, what do you are coming? To, sorry. Thanks. What do you, what do? You, I'm looking at all these names and misreading. Um, would you like more time? I think, yeah. October, I think October 26th is fine. I think what really needs to happen is um, we need to catch Mr. Jones up on the history of what's been going on with this. Um, Mr. Jones, no offense to you, you are probably the third attorney we've dealt with with respect to this property. And that's and I've only been with the city of Evanston since January. So that doesn't even account for the people that have um, dealt with this property when uh, Michelle Mason Cup was the corporation counsel. So I think that we need to have that discussion, get Mr. Jones up to speed as to where we have been as far as the city's concerned, as far as his client's concerned. Uh, and then maybe we come back on the 26th. Um, I honestly cannot tell you how this particular resolution came about, but um, I'm sure that will be discussed as well. Uh, would it be, uh, is it possible, um, Ms. Niden, if they are not prepared to go forward on the 26th, that maybe Mr. Jones just, this is a little too much information for him to digest, uh, that they could change it to uh, the 9th, November 9th then, or once we set the date certain, is that, is that um, in concrete? 
that's in concrete. I would recommend that in this, for this matter, we set a date certain and we stick to it because this this um, particular item has many moving parts and they've had multiple meetings. And um, as you understand, there's many neighbors that are concerned about the outcome. So I think in fairness to all, we set a date and we stick to it. Okay. Uh, um, Alderman Revell, is there, uh, would you like to chime in on this? Uh, well, why don't we um, be extra generous and go with that first, that date in November then? November 9th? Yeah. Sounds preferable, honestly. Okay. Let's do that then. Okay. Um, so I move that we table to November 9th. Second. All right. All those in favor, of, well, no, we have to take the roll. Yeah. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. And Alderman Rainey? Aye. Okay. Motion passed. So that's all of our items for consideration. And now we have items for discussion. This is PDD1. Uh, regulations regarding the occupancy of dwelling units, including the definition of family. Uh, staff recommends that we have this discussion and uh, staff is seeking feedback for uh, from us. Oh, yeah. okay. Alderman Wilson, I'm uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was looking at my... Uh... That's okay. Um, thank you. I had made a reference before to talk about the, um, uh, the three unrelated uh, ordinance and you know, this obviously goes back to a long running conversation that we've been having. One of the threshold questions that causes me concern about this is that what we're doing, and this is in the memo a little bit, but the, um, you know, our analysis of occupancy of dwelling units is based on a, um, I don't want to call it an arbitrary definition of family, but it's based on a definition of family. Uh, and I'm not really comfortable with that. I, I feel like occupancy should be more focused on uh, the configuration of the structure and the actual occupancy and numbers uh, of people that are occupying the space. Um, that seems to be more uh, directly related to uh, to safety, to potentially addressing a, a lot of these um, fairly serious neighborhood concerns. And I also don't feel comfortable with the idea of, um, you know, getting into, uh, you know, people's personal relationships. You know, I don't want... Uh, you know, a complaint to result in a, in a household having to, you know, justify and explain their familial relationships. I don't really feel like the government has uh, a lot of business doing, you know, that level of, of analysis or scrutiny. Um, you know, this is a, you know, it's a bigger conversation. I think what should be a part of that conversation uh, should include um, the, um, the tools that we either have or need to have in place to address the concerns of the neighborhoods uh, that are that are struggling with some of these problems with uh, with over occupancy in spaces. Uh, these are significant and serious concerns, and I hear those. But um, but the three unrelated ordinance isn't addressing that. The, the, the problems persist. They persisted for a long time, and we need to be doing something that actually is going to end up being effective. So I think that any of the changes with regard to this ordinance have to come with a um, you know, uh, some clear direction on how these problems are going to get addressed. Uh, so, so I would like to further explore this uh, next time it kind of comes across our plate. We've got a lot of um, materials from prior, you know, discussions and considerations on that. I'd like to see those materials compiled so we can kind of see, you know, where we've come and where we've been. So we're not reinventing any wheels. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's my, you know, that's my general concern. Alderman uh, Fisk. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I'm, I'm fine with taking a look at that. And um, I, I don't think it's going to solve the problem that Alderman Wilson's talking about in terms of occupancy. But um, I, I, I do believe, and uh, Director Knighton, if you can uh, tell me if my, my belief is true, that um, when we look at changing family of three unrelated, that, that really needs to go in the plan commission for discussion and study. Um, is that correct? Uh, yes, it's part of Title VI. So the, 
those items would we need to go to the planning commission if we change those. Well, so I I'd, I'd be I'd be comfortable in making it the uh, the referral to the planning commission. And and I hesitate to do that because I what I think I'd rather do. Um, I don't think we should be playing around with like the definition of family. I think what we should be doing is looking at, you know, how we're addressing occupancy. So in other words, getting away from this definition of family and looking at, um, you know, looking at the um, actual like numbers and configurations of the spaces. So well, that's, know, what we're talking about. that's what we're talking about. Yeah, well, it, it still needs to go to the, go to the plan commission. Well, I just I, I want to be more clear than just send it to them with uh, the idea to look at the definition of family. To me, well, you, can, you can send it with direction. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. And I'm just I'm just trying to give a clear direction on that. Well, but you're making it unclear, quite frankly. We we don't we're not interested in the in the definition of family. Everybody has their own definition. We're interested in how we move forward with this restriction. Or if we move. Without the restriction, right, and and what's going to be in place to to address the um, the, the, the gap? That's the point. All right. I move we refer right, this. Hold on, plan. hold on, Ann. I have um, Alderman Ravel. Oh, I think I yeah. I'd like the plan commission to have a pretty broad discussion about mm -hmm. a variety of issues around, um, basically, um, multifamily. Um, here's the word family again. Um, yeah. But one one idea, for example, I'd be interested in their um, considering um, home sharing, uh, whether that's something that we want to make possible, because I'm not sure that we allow that in the current ordinance. So whatever, you know, have the plan commission take a broad look at different types of housing that will address a lot of affordability issues that we've been thinking about. and. Um, as well as address the concerns that we're hearing from neighbors in certain parts of our community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alderman Rue Simmons. And I wasn't sure if um, I know that Alderman Rainey said we weren't we weren't really challenging family status, but I want to make sure when it goes to um, that next commission that that is included on how you um, identify and define rather your family. I want to make sure that that is included as well. Mm -hmm. Right, and I mean, just just to be clear, um, our, our 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 code does define family now, and um, and the plan commission, I'm I'm sure will um, will take a look at that, and and what they just need is direction from from us. Uh, but I I I think this is a a perfect example of something that uh, has uh, tentacles throughout um, our policy documents and. Um, and I, I don't feel that we as a council are the, the experts in putting all these pieces together. I think staff and the plan commission are and bring that back to us, um, in, in response to our direction. So I, I feel that that is the right way to go. And, and frankly, that's the legal way to go. So. Well, I, I, as chair, I'll just say, I, I agree with that. I think it needs. You know, this is something that we have been um, uh, discussing in one form or another for quite a while, and uh, the the problems do continue. And actually, it sounds like they've accelerated a little bit. So, I I would hope that the plan commission looks at uh, maintaining community because I think that's one of the things that we seem to hear from the the neighbors who live in that area is that it's it isn't necessarily individual students or the fact that students live near them, but it's the concentration and then the sense of loss of community uh, that they have. So I, I think that um, bundled within all of this, and I think home sharing is uh, is a very good idea. We have these, you know, enormous houses sometimes, and uh, certainly there's room for home sharing. Um, and there are lots of different definite ways that people define families, and there's um, uh, there's law on uh, on how you define a family and that it cannot be too restrictive. So uh, I think that, that it is worth a deep dive on the part of the Planning Commission and also to include then how do we um, address these issues 
that we continually have of, um, I don't want to use the word blight, but, uh, you know, um, community, uh, lo the loss of community uh, and loss of maintenance of homes and, um, and uh, all of the things that we've heard from the neighbors. Yes, Alderman Wilson. And, and, I, and I just, you know, I personally feel like if we can get away from this, this idea of the three unrelated rule, uh, which hasn't had the impact or the effect uh, to solve uh, the legitimate problems and potentially has the effect of, of creating harm. But if we can get back to the idea of looking at um, at the physical capacity of uh, both the you know, actually buildings, the uh, dwelling units, the homes, and the neighborhood, I think that's the more appropriate way to look at that and, and not to look at that three unrelated aspect of it. Or isn't it, at least not focus on that as the um, as trying to use that as a tool. So that's just my opinion. All right. Uh, did someone, Alderman Rusement or or Anne, uh, Alderman Rainey, were you going to make the referral? I'm referring uh, the matter of um, three unrelated uh, to the plan commission for a full study on how we should go forward in in alleviating that restriction. Second. All right. We don't need to take a vote on that, do we, Ms. Niden? Um, I will check the law, but I don't think we do for that, for referral. Give me one second. And, you caught me off guard. Sorry. <laughs> and would <laughs> take a quick call, would it, just to do it? I think I as long as you have a second, you're okay. Okay. Under normal circumstances, we would need a we would need a vote because the plan commission is not a standing committee. Right. I needed a vote when I referred to the plan commissions. So. Let's just vote on it. Well, then this is normal conditions. I mean, let's yeah, let's just vote on it. Then we need to vote on it. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Nyden, would you call Alderman Fitz? Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferden? Aye. Alderman Ravel? Aye. And Alderman Rainey? Aye. The ayes have it. So it's a blank question. All right. Uh, and then we are, we have one item for communication, PDC1, mobility in the time of COVID-19. Uh, and Alderman Wynn, we have a brief presentation from our Transportation Mobility Coordinator, Jessica Heink. Um, there have been a handful of questions that many of you had and others about what's going on with public transportation and other mobility issues over the past six months in the pandemic and some interesting trends have emerged. So um, we thought it would be best to bring to the Planning and Development Committee to keep you all in the loop of these things. All right. Take it away. Good evening. Right. Jeff, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, good evening. I will share my screen. Okay. Um, so tonight I'm going to discuss mobility and the time of COVID-19 and how it relates to riding public transit, bicycle mobility, the new delivery economy, and re-envisioning the public right-of-way. A lot of this uh, probably seems very obvious to many of you. However, uh, while many of us have access to a personal vehicle or a bicycle, um, there are others who do not have um, that access and cannot choose to work from home and do not have the ability. These are our essential workers. These are people who need to get to medical appointments or get their groceries and they do rely on public transit. And while, and so like I said, while these recommendations may seem obvious, I'd like to chat about what is happening um, internationally. And so, uh, you know, we have requirements to wear masks when we're in public, but as you can see in that lower photo, absolutely everyone is wearing a mask. Um, and that's because uh, people cannot enter 
this subway platform in Guajau without uh, having a mask on, and that is enforced. Uh, recently in New York, they passed a fine so that if you enter the subway station you without a mask, you will be fined. Um, but other countries are, are taking it a step further. Uh, in Beijing, in the, the top two corners, or two, top two photos, excuse me, uh, there are temperature checks and thermal sensors to identify if somebody should not be getting on the train. And then there are isolation areas at many stations throughout China, actually, to uh, for people to go to if they do have a temperature and should not be riding public transit. All of this has resulted in a very high confidence level in transit um, in other international, in other countries throughout the world. And so we are seeing ridership increase at a more significant rate than in the US because there are all of these measures that are adding a lot of confidence level in the transit system. Locally, I'm going to talk about some small projects first, and then I'll move on some larger projects that are being implemented that do have impacts on COVID-19 and then transit ridership in general. In many places, you'll see designations of um, where to sit or where to stand at bus stations and at um, bus shelters. The CTA has implemented them the logo that you see in the top right corner at our station platforms to help people social distance. Then there are also um, bus trackers that we have implemented as a city in planned developments and worked with local, local grocery stores like Valley Foods to help people know when the bus will arrive so that they do not have to congregate at bus stops and they can time when they get on buses a little bit better. And then also there are trackers, the lower photo at the bottom that show when there are higher frequency ridership so that people can help plan if they have the convenience to of leaving earlier or later, for example, for their trips. Moving on to large transit projects, the first I'd like to tell you about is an RTA grant that the city has received for approximately $270,000 that will help the city implement accessible bus stops at all um, bus stops in Evanston. This will allow for social distancing. As you can see at the photo of a bus stop on Ridge at Greenleaf, there isn't really a lot of area to stand at that bus stop in order to social distance. And so having bus stop pads won't only be accessible for people who use an assistive device like a wheelchair or have a stroller or a grocery cart. It will also help people um, just maintain their distance. And they won't also have to flag the bus to stop. The bus will just automatically stop for them now under this new grant program that the city is participating in. Moving on, the RPM modernization project is starting to get kicked off with a task force meeting. Um, this project is starting with a study to evaluate the Purple Line in Evanston and part of Chicago because it's beyond its useful life. And this means that the, the stations will be lengthened, um, this, which will allow longer train cars. And we need longer train cars um, to support growing ridership on the Red Purple Line, but also right now so that people can actually social distance. We have fewer cars running on the purple line than we do on other train lines in Evanston. This first study is actually a 1.3 million project. It's quite costly to do this kind of evaluation. And then the first phase of um, the red line modernization in Chicago is going to cost a little over $2 billion for construction. And we are anticipating that the purple line um, modernization will be a multi-million dollar project and will be quite costly as well. 
Then um, the next thing I'd like to move on to is bicycle mobility. And so bike shops can't keep bikes in stock and that's bikes of all kind. And year over year change in bicycle sales it has increased exponentially as people are looking at other forms of transportation to get around, not only um, for work, but then also just for something to do while people have to social distance. And as part of that, some communities are implementing slow streets. This example is from Chicago. And what that means is that a car that can still get down that street if you live there, but there are some um, indications to cars to slow down that people are walking and using this area to bike. Evanston is also in a great location for tourism as people want to get out and go to restaurants and eat outside. And so um, tourism is increasing with bicycle tourism that's increasing significantly. And that is something that Evanston can position itself to encourage with slow streets. Next, I want to turn to Divi Bike Share. And so we heard you in 2019 when city council said that Divi can't cost anything, anything anymore. And so that cost has been eliminated. In addition to eliminating the cost, there are now 90 new electric bikes. Um, so the system has expanded, almost doubled in size. And that means that um, people can also now park bikes with a lock two system at bike racks in places throughout Evanston. And so you don't have to dock at a station anymore. And that's really increased the use of this program. Additionally, Divi has seen um, their ridership um, skyrocket in recent months as people have looked for other ways of getting around that allow them to social distance. Next, I would like Jessica, to Jessica, could you go back to the last slide and explain that map, what we're seeing? Because I think that's important sure. to note that the electric bikes and the dockless bikes have done something we, that the council wanted. Yeah, and so um, really the goal with these uh, 90 new electric bikes is to expand reach throughout all of Evanston. And um, you, what you see with the green markers are fixed stations in Evanston. And then these black markers are where people have docked um, these free floating electric bikes. And even though they're, they're dockless, they have to be locked to um, ideally a bike rack in order to end their trip. Um, and the trip will not end unless it is, um, if, unless the bike is locked up. This is just, you know, one example on one day where some of these bikes ended up in Evanston, but we've seen them throughout all of Evanston and um, we're, we're really seeing um, this system allow people to use it as a last mile source to get to transit and then also to get to work. Then moving on to the new delivery economy. And so um, this is uh, an item that may be considered as part of the budget this year because um, there are some significant impacts to the convenience that we are starting to see with delivery with, you know, same day delivery in many cases, it's really taking off with COVID-19 and that's having a real impact on um, our local businesses um, with people not going in to shop at our local businesses with as much frequency when they can just purchase something from Amazon and it can be there the same day or the next day in many cases. And then also um, with tax revenue. And, um, but I also want to emphasize that the increase in these, deliv in these delivery vehicles on Evanston streets have a real impact on those city streets and maintenance and then also with um, congestion and greenhouse gas emissions. And so this is really tied to 
the Climate Action and Resilience Plan is tied to the Complete and Green Streets policy because there are safety issues with these additional vehicles making sudden stops on the streets. And, and so the city is looking at potentially um, considering how we can encourage um, use of other modes to complete these trips. You can see that UPS has implemented a bicycle trip. And so they have a local warehouse and then they have bicyclists that move from those warehouses to deliver packages. Uh, we're also seeing other cities implementing congestion taxes. And so just looking at how the city can evaluate our response to the economic impacts of um, delivery vehicles. And then finally, COVID-19 has really presented opportunities to re-envision the public right-of-way uh, for both um, pedestrians and outdoor placemaking. Many of our signals right now, you have to push. And, and so um, just beyond um, COVID-19, the, the health concerns of that are not ideal when we can have automatic pedestrian signals that you don't have to touch, that um, somebody in a wheelchair doesn't have to strain to try to reach. And then on a, on a more, um, even more positive note, there's a lot of outdoor placemaking that's happening um, as a result of people social distancing outside. And this is a really great opportunity to re-envision how we use our public rights of way to encourage people to make, to continue making Evanston the great place to live that it is. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Any questions? Thank you very much, Jessica. That's an, that was excellent. Yeah, very very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have one question: uh, Are any cities, uh, um, uh, let's see, incentivizing or disincentivizing uh, electric? Uh, I mean, excuse me, gas, gasoline powered um, delivery trucks. You know, so if you, is there a way to incentivize? I recognize we're a small city to do that, but uh, incentivize a, um, a delivery fleet to be electric rather than uh, rather than you know gasoline powered or diesel powered is actually what they are. Yeah, and so there are carrot and stick approaches for doing that. Uh, with the carrot approaches, there are um, places where there are actual financial dollars that are given um, for. Um, companies to transition to electric fleets. And then with, with the stick approaches, it, it is more of a tax and where perhaps you get a tax break or you don't have to pay the tax if you are implementing electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that is something that many communities have looked at doing. Uh, and then there are also um, places like California that recently have adopted standards and that have said that um, they're going to have all fleets be electric by a certain date and, and all vehicles will be electric yeah. mm -hmm. that are sold new in the state of California. Yeah, um, that, that. That, that involves um, working with the state of Illinois. It's a bigger project than local, um, but tax incentives are um, really what is leading the charge. Well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, whereas uh, many other communities, uh, after, like in the fourth month of COVID, they were, they were, um, they, you know, the EPA was measuring pollution in, um, in a number of other cities around the country at, that it had dropped significantly and it did not drop in the Chicago area. And it was because of transportation. Deliveries were still happening and it's diesel you know that's what it is so uh that you know that's a we we need to get rid of diesel yeah absolutely yeah yeah uh, alderman Ravel. um so jessica your memo mentioned that paris is has implemented a tax on deliveries so if you order something from amazon i guess paris puts a little tax on that is that something have, have u.s cities started doing that is that anything we want to look at 
And so what U.S. cities are doing are related more to congestion taxes rather than um, singling out any particular um, type of vehicle. I would note that in Evanston, there are there's already some sort of fee for every other vehicle that's operating in the city of Evanston, except for delivery vehicles. And so um, if we were to look at something like a congestion tax, it, it may make sense to target delivery vehicles when all other vehicles are already paying a fee for for using city of Evanston streets. Alderman Rainey. Let's remember who's going to pay that fee. And something um, I might say is we, we already are paying the fee with the additional wear and tear on our streets with the health concerns that result from greenhouse gas emissions and then the, the safety issues of um, increased um, traffic accidents and, and injuries from um, additional vehicles on roads. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else who would like to uh, share anything or ask any other questions? Uh, I don't see any other hands. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hank. This is uh, really interesting information and I think it's all gonna be part of our lives faster than we expect. Thank you. Okay. I so I move that we accept and place this on file. I think that was the request. Second. All right. Ms. Nyden, would you call the roll? Alderman Fisk? Aye. Alderman Wynn? Aye. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Sufferton? Yeah. Alderman Ravel? Aye. And Alderman Rainey? Aye. Okay. Accept and place them bio. Okay, thank you very much. That was an excellent report. All right, at that point we have um, we have finished our agenda. Would someone move to adjourn? So move. Second. All right, Ms. Nyden, would you call the roll? I don't have to call the roll for this one. Oh, good. All right. All, right. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. All right, and the city council uh, is scheduled to start 5.30. At, I'm sorry, what time? 5.30. 5.30? You just pick a time. All right, so let's say the city council will start at 6.15. Oh, excellent. Okay. All right, all right, we're all here, so. All right, thank you all.